All right, hey everyone, welcome to Softcast. This is your host, Matt Parrish, and today we've got an incredible episode where our team went on location up to Boston to highlight one of the ways that U.S. Special Operations Command is trying to stay at the technological forefront of things like warfighter brain health. You've heard us speak about this on other episodes, and it really is important. As the POTIF senior enlisted leader, I'll tell you that brain health and cognitive function is so important across all phases of your life, and it doesn't matter what type of job you have within our force. It doesn't matter if you're on the front lines, you know, kicking in the door or back supporting that effort. Being able to make better decisions faster is so important. And so as we've noticed a trend of impact coming from some of these things like explosive breaching or from shoulder fire munitions from this what we call residual low-level blast, we realize that it doesn't manifest itself and it doesn't show up on imaging in the same way that traditional concussive events, like you may have heard of CTE and things like that from professional and amateur sports or from motor vehicle accidents, these blast wave injuries, they don't show up in the same way. So we've got to be on the forefront technologically to try to find how can we get an imaging system that will better show us these injuries. And so we took this opportunity to go up and talk to some of the world's leading experts up in Boston as they're pioneering a study called ReBlast to help us do just that. So I hope you really enjoy this episode of Softcast. Hey everybody, welcome to Softcast. Uh, this is your host, Command Chief Master Sergeant Greg Smith, Senior Enlisted Leader of United States Special Operations Command. And I'm coming at you live today with a pretty important uh, offsite, if you will. We're at the Martino Center for Biomedical Engineering. And this is uh, one of Massachusetts General Hospital's uh, key uh, performance centers, if you will, that really looks at some, some cutting edge technology in partnership with Harvard, Harvard Medical School. So with me today, I've got some pretty important special guests. So I'll just start here and work my way down, right? Dr. Yelena Bodine uh, from Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical as well. So Dr. Brian Edlow, it's always good to see you again, sir. And then our 15th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Mick Pond, Russ Smith. Russ, it's always good to have you here as well. Yeah, man, thanks. So why are we here and why would we be doing a soft cast from offsite? Um, you know, we, since 9-11, um, the, the continual combat operations have taught us a couple of key significant issues. And one of those is warfighter brain health. We are just now in the very early stages of understanding the impact of sustained combat operations and repetitive concussions uh, on, on the warfighter. And Dr. Edlow, I'll start with you. Uh, what is this program that you have here and, and why does it matter to us? Thank you so much, Chief Smith. It's an honor to be here. As a big fan of the show, I just want to say how much this means to us. So thank you for inviting us to join yes, you. The goal of the ReBlast study that we're conducting as a collaboration between Mass General as well as in partnership with SOCOM is to detect the effects of blast on the brain. There's emerging evidence from recent studies that blasts are associated with certain neurological symptoms like headaches, dizziness, and cognitive deficits like difficulty with memory or attention but we don't fundamentally understand the mechanisms by which blasts cause those symptoms, and we don't have an objective diagnostic test to detect them. And so operators who experience these symptoms may not have a way to know whether it's from blasts or from other exposures related to combat or from, to PTSD. And so we need to empower operators by giving them a reliable tool to understand their own brain health and to seek the treatment that they need. That's amazing. And Dr. Bodine, how, how, do you, how do you see ReBlast fitting into the larger, larger kind of category as brain health from where, your, from where your vantage point is? Thank you so much, Chief Smith. And I'll just echo what Dr. Edlow said. We're so very, very happy and just um, blessed to be here. So thanks for giving us the time. You know, for me, I think ReBlast is really about three key objectives. We want to be able to detect and we want to be able to diagnose injury to the brain that's related to blast before it causes the symptoms that Dr. Edlow just talked about, before we see problems with cognition, thinking abilities, before we see things that are happening that are affecting daily life. And then subsequently, we want to know, once somebody has those types of symptoms, what can we do to treat them? We think that blast injury is very specific. It's not the same as a, as a severe or a moderately severe traumatic brain injury. It's probably its own type of injury and requires its own types of treatments. At what point do we need to pause? At what point is too much is blast, too much blast, and we need to take maybe a minute to go back. And thirdly, we want to be able to prevent it long term because the end goal, and I think we can all agree, is to have uh, America's warfighters being out there longer, being the best that they can be longer, but also having a good quality of life when they come back home 
and they're able to uh, leave the force and retire. Yeah, one of, one of the great benefits of Special Operations Command is we can often, because of our acquisitions agility and our ability to sublet and pathfind, we really pathfind for the larger DOD in a lot of ways. And General Clark is up here with us today. We've had a great morning uh, kind of going through talking to all of the medical experts and really tour, touring the facility and seeing these amazing things that are happening that we'll get into. Um, but really, I think it's implications on the broader DOD and MCPON. I know to you, um, you know, the implications on the Navy. Yeah. So, you know, what SOCOM does today in, in as they typically do in leading the way uh, in these critical areas because of the, the population you have and the, the trauma that you're continuously exposed to, um, it, it's going to help inform and drive that uh, that technology, that data, that stuff that we can use that eventually will enable and, and assist the greater the greater Navy, the greater military, and even the nation. I mean, think collegiate sports, repetitive head trauma, uh, and the impacts of that, and how to detect and, and, and figure out how to best treat. How many concussions are too many? Uh, is somebody ready to go? Are they not? Um, we have airmen on aircraft carriers who uh, suffer from re repeated exposure to, you know, brain trauma and, and body shocking trauma. And um, we have sailors on destroyers who do things that put them in similar positions, submarines on in aircraft squadrons, falling off a plane, hitting your head. The cranial may, may save your, your skull, but you may still suffer a brain injury. Yeah. And uh, watching you guys as you lead the way in developing this, this path forward, it's going to eventually benefit all of us. So. Yeah, and how did the CNO, what's, I mean, the CNO has kind of charged you in a lot of ways, and I know that you, you're up here on behalf of the entire Navy, so again, it's a, it's a tremendous honor to have you here, and it also shows the Navy's investment in warfighter brain health of all the sailors across the fleet, and I think those are important things, and I know you and the CNO have a lot of discussions on this about the health, the long-term health of your sailors. So we, we do, and uh, uh, I'm very honored and appreciative of, the, of you extending the invite. Um, so talking about mental health is something I do routinely. My own challenges, my own use of the systems, the various systems from the chaplaincy to mental health, um, <clears throat> but physiological effects on the brain do manifest in mental health issues. And you know, as we try to get our arms around mental health issues, understanding the physiological effects that may drive some of those behaviors <coughs> absolutely matters. And that's again, why it's of, of importance to the greater Navy, not just SOCOM operators. Yeah, so I think, I mean, one of the big areas here is reblast, and reblast is one of about a thousand different studies, but it's a key one, one of the kind of the key six that SOCOM is looking at. And uh, Dr. Edlaw, I'll start with you. When we talk about reblast, um, well, there's really kind of six kind of subcomponents. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the first ones is advanced neural imaging. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Thank you, Chief Smith. So it's important to acknowledge that there are profound unanswered questions in this field. There are many things that we don't understand about the biomechanics of how blasts affect the brain and how those effects on the brain might lead to the symptoms we discussed earlier. Mm. So as we approach this study, we needed to acknowledge with humility that we are in a discovery science phase yeah. of this work, and we needed to cast a broad net. So there's been a, a lot of important work by other groups over the last two decades, but we couldn't cat put all of our eggs in one basket because there's no single technology that has shown it is the most likely to provide us with a diagnostic test. So to cast a wide net, we looked at several different types of imaging, which we'll talk about in more detail in a moment. These include seven Tesla MRI for functional brain mapping, a connectome MRI scan for mapping the structural networks that support brain function, two different types of PET scans that look at inflammation within the brain, tau deposition with the, into the brain, and then a really comprehensive set of cognitive, behavioral, and somatic symptom assessments. And in order to perform a study that is that comprehensive, we need to put it together a multidisciplinary team. And I'd like to speak for a moment about what has inspired this team and the yeah. commitment that we have to this project. So there are several members of the team who have been studying traumatic brain injury for their careers, Dr. Bonied and I, since we started our lab in 2014, the Lab for Neuroimaging of Coma and Consciousness. This is the population that we've been dedicated to. But there are many collaborators, experts in other fields, engineers, physicists, who have not necessarily studied traumatic brain injury for their whole lives, but when they heard about the opportunity to support the soft community, every single member of our team said, absolutely, sign yeah. me up. That's the level of commitment that MGH and Harvard Medical School has to this community and to this project. Yeah, so as I always interpret often, right, so um, there are some amazing brain doctors and scientists and physicists out here walking through, and it's really, um, you heard this thing called the seven Tesla MRI, right, and these are, there's probably 
26 or, or 30 or 50 of these things in the world. I mean, it, it, this is a normal MRI is a one or a three MRI, if you will. This thing is, is basically more than two and a half times the size of power of imaging the brain. So think of it as HD TV for the brain, for the simple team room guy, right? Who's going, okay, why does this matter to me? Because you have the ability and the granularity to get down very, very, very deep into the white matter, gray matter, neuroplasticity, and things that affect cognitive function. I think this advanced neuroimaging is really groundbreaking, and it's allowing us to see and predict better than ever. Is that fair? Absolutely. And it's also important to consider that, we, as you pointed out, we are able to see microstructural changes in the brain that cannot be seen with other scanners. And the reason that's so important, especially for this population, is that these are the most elite warfighters, that's the mentally and physically toughest human beings on the planet. Yeah. And they're starting from such a high baseline that if we're going to detect changes in their brain, we need to be able to identify very subtle changes that would distinguish them from each other yeah. and from healthy control subjects that you might find in another community. Yeah. I was just, maybe I'll just add that uh, a key aspect of ReBlast is not just using these very advanced technologies, but also thinking about the next step. How can we take the information we learned from the 7 Tesla MRI, which isn't going to be available at every site and certainly isn't going to be available in the theater anytime soon, what can we associate with the findings from the advanced neuroimaging that can then be translated much closer to the field and much closer to the time of the actual exposure to BLAST? And so we have, in addition to the, to the neuroimaging, blood biomarkers and cognitive tests and even questionnaires that might be closely related to the findings that Dr. Edlow talked about on the 7 Tesla scanner, but are going to be deployable and able to be used on an everyday basis in the field, in the theater, where we want to be able to detect blast exposure immediately. Yeah, you must have read, you must have read my mind. Oh. <laughs> yes. No, this is great, because I'm going to pull the thread on that just a little bit about blood biomarkers, right? So, I mean, that, that's a fancy term, but it's really about mapping the blood for predictive and post-incident analytics. I mean, what, what, what does that mean? What does blood biomarkers mean? Dr. Bodine, I'll start with you. Sure. So think about a simple blood test. You take, you know, a tablespoon or a tablespoon and a half of blood using a very simple prick that we get all the time when we go to the doctor's office. And just think about your regular clinical test, whether it's, you know, looking at cholesterol, high and low cholesterol or whatnot. Now think about expanding that into looking at things in the blood that might be able to tell you something about the brain. And that's kind of the next step that we're talking about here. Are there proteins, are there markers in the blood that we can identify that are associated with known brain injury? Neurofilament light, or NFL for short, is an example of such a biomarker. We know that it's associated with traumatic brain injury. We don't know yet if it's associated with blast injury, but we suspect that it might be. And so that's one of the blood biomarkers that we're going to be able to test. And can you imagine? Somebody is exposed to blast uh, either through training or out in combat. All they need to do is get a simple blood test to be able to say, okay, you have or you have not been exposed to blast, or now you've been exposed to too much blast, let's take a quick break, a timeout, go back in. Maybe that marker will go down with time and back into the, into the uh, field you can go. And that's the kind of translatable information that we want to be able to get. Yeah, Russ, back. I think about our corpsmen being able to carry this out where, and then through machine learning and other ways that we're able to rapidly, just through one quick draw of blood, be able to tell whether or not you've been overexposed. Your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's going to be a, a game changer on the battlefield because you can very quickly assess whether someone's ready to get back in the fight or if you've got to send them back. So, yeah. And so this, you know, at a, at a very tactical level, and I mean, for us, from a readiness perspective level of advising commanders and, and, and commodores on risk of, of risk to force, if you will, it's, it's, this is another one of those tools that goes, that kind of goes along with that, that enables the warfighter to rapidly assess it's one piece. So if kind of these six subcategories, you know, we kind of talked about the imaging and these blood bio, uh, blood biomarkers. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, again, to too much. I mean, think about yeah. scaling this out to um, when a Navy player knocks an, an Army football player out, uh, <laughs> and then they can assess with a blood test whether they're safe to get back in the game or they do need to sit out for you know a game or several games. This What a great example of ways that, that I believe that SOCOM, trying to be on that advanced leading edge, will, for a very specific purpose of our warfighters, yeah. our warfighters is really a larger pronoun. It's really our nation. So, and it's really our allies and our partners as well. It's really how, how, we, how we look at it. And the revolutionary advances that you are doing right here 
Um, I think it makes it one of the preeminent medical centers in, in, in the world. So it's very simply. So this third one gets more into neuropsychology, right? But so as we talked about neuroimaging, which is amazing, we just toured the seven Tesla and the Tau PET, which are really about proteins in the brain and how they function. Um, the third one about this neurocognitive assessment. Dr. Ed Lowe, can you walk us through a little bit of that? Absolutely. So we put together a comprehensive neurocognitive assessment that is, again, aimed at detecting subtle changes in the most elite warfighters. So designing tests that are not necessarily looking at differences in an average population, but in people who are performing at the highest levels. And I'd like to acknowledge here the leadership from Vice Admiral Szymanski, who visited us a few months ago and helped to inspire us and to help us understand what are the needs of this community and how we can be most responsive to them. And to follow up on a point that Dr. Bodhi made a moment ago, we recognize that many of these fancy scanners are not gonna be deployable in theater. So we need to come up with ways to detect subtle changes, whether it's a blood biomarker or a very sensitive cognitive assessment that might tell a team this person needs a little bit of a break. Yeah. And we've heard you uh, and Sergeant Major Parrish talk on this softcast about the culture change and helping the, the force understand that treatment for brain injury can be seen as a positive. It's a way to get you back into the fight in a way that you will be operating at an optimal level and a way to prolong career longevity. Yeah. So our goal is certainly not to stand in the way of somebody being in the team room or somebody going back to the next deployment, but rather to give them the tools to make sure they're operating at the highest levels at all times. Yeah, I think it's important that our VA medical centers right now are really working very hard to incorporate some of these assessments. We are re-looking at those in our assessment and selection program. I know things like the ANAM and the neurocognitive assessment tool or test, the NCAT, these are things that we're trying to incorporate. And I know, you know, for us, there's implications across the Navy of, of baselining neurocognitive assessment on the front end. Yeah, absolutely. So, so those are kind of, you know, the, those top three, if you will, really, uh, you know, fused together with kind of these bottom three. And, and Dr. Bodine, I'll ask you a little bit about blast exposure and TBI history kind of being that sure. fourth pillar of the six pillar, you know, uh, approach. Excellent. Yeah. So blast exposure is very hard to measure. We don't really have precise, validated, and subjective tools to measure how much blast any one individual is exposed to. To do that, we have to have either extremely sensitive but robust gauges that are not falling off and being disrupted during, during the combat moments, or we have to have some sort of very structured and very formal questionnaire that's been validated in the field. We don't quite have those tools yet. We do have tools, um, something called the generalized uh, uh, blast exposure value that does test a little bit of that question of blast exposure, but we don't have it's, don't have precise. And I think what we really need, especially with blast exposure, is precision. Because again, it's not like you're getting hit in the head so hard that anybody can tell you've had a brain injury. You have a big bleed in the brain. You can mm -hmm. see it on a scan. You've lost consciousness. That's a clear traumatic brain injury. That's not what we're talking about. Again, we're talking about subtle changes. And to measure subtle changes, we need to have precision. Precision in the brain imaging, precision in the biomarkers, precision in the cognitive tests. And I think very importantly, precision in how we quantify how much blast somebody has been exposed to. Yeah, Dr. Edla, how do, how do I absorb blast cognitively, if you will? I mean, we were talking about through imaging and some of the ways that the waves or the overpressure happens. Can you walk me through that? I, I'm high school math, right? So, so, so the current biomechanical model suggests that blast waves penetrate the skull, the intracranial vault, via the opening. So the ear canals, the orbits, the nasal passages, and at the base of the skull. And the brain structures that are in closest proximity to those openings in the skull appear to be the structures that are most at risk. But this highlights one of the important complexities of this study, which is if we think about the brain structures that are closest to the ear canals, for example, yeah. the brain stem, the part of our brain that connects the top of the spinal cord to the rest of the brain, this controls many of our vital functions, including our fight or flight responses. It's also close to the cerebellum, which controls balance and coordination. If we think about these elite warfighters, they probably have the most finely tuned and finely wired brainstem and cerebellum. Don't tell them that they're elite. I tell them they're not special every day. <laughs> but so if we are using these new imaging tests and cognitive and behavioral tests to detect abnormalities there, yeah. how do we begin to identify those abnormalities if their connectivity within those regions, when, they're, when we're mapping those highways that are sending the signals from one part of the brain to another, if those are really finely wired to start with, they may appear normal on a scanner within the normal range, but it might be different from what that person's baseline is. Yeah. 
So we need to think very carefully about the mechanisms of BLAST to directly answer your question. Where are they affecting the brain within the skull? And then how do we best measure that and identify a change to get a sense of when somebody might need treatment or preventive care? Yeah, Russ, and I think when we think the, across the fleet, again, as I look, I'm, I'm, the purpose of this episode in a lot of ways is showing kind of SOCOM as a pathfinder, but really scaling up to a sure. large organization like the United States Navy is a pretty large organization. Right. So and the implications across the fleet as we kind of refine and find it. So we're kind of a control group, but really there's significant implications. Yeah. I mean, uh, to the point that she made earlier, uh, Dr. Boni made, you can't scale up necessarily the ability to say, like, do a baseline MRI for every sailor in the Navy. It wouldn't work. Um, in niche populations, the Naval Academy, we have a baseline MRI because you need that point of departure to figure out you know, what was normal before, because you may not have been you know, within that normal range. You might have been slightly above it. Uh, my case slightly below it. So um, finding out wh how that effect, what the effect is, yeah. um, and finding ways to scale up perhaps indicators of change rather than, you know, having that baseline for everyone, I think is, is where the Navy will be able to capitalize on this. So then there's this fifth pillar, right? This, and it's, it's a, it's, it's dolphin speak to me. So I need you to make it make sense. Right. But it's this, it's this clinical symptom and global outcomes reporting, but it's self self-reported. Like, like, Dr. Woody, I'll start with you. What does that mean? Okay, so we can break it down. So global function, just think about your day-to-day. -day. It's the things that you need to be happening in your life to make yourself a successful citizen, a successful warfighter in your day-to-day. -day. And you can even think about a simple thing, like making a grocery list, writing it down, going to the store, not forgetting what you're doing, coming back home without the things that you need. It's all those day-to-day -day functions that you have the cognitive test, and the cognitive test, they're going to measure memory. But the global function test, they're going to measure how those cognitive functions affect your day-to-day -day life. So somebody might actually have a quite substantial memory impairment, but they yeah. have compensated with so many other tools in their toolbox, or maybe they're super resilient yeah. and they're able to compensate and, and their global functions fine. They can kind of go day to day, but their memory measures are pretty, uh, yeah. are Matt pretty Parrish important. would interject here if he were here and say, you know, as an ODA uh, team guy, you know, it's about what we call pre-combat checks and pre-combat you know, inspections where it's this memory that you commit that it's the, it's the, so we rely so heavily on memory and repetitive drills that anything that disrupts that now, and as I'm self-reporting these things, Dr. Edlow, is that, is that really what I'm looking at now? Is I'm looking at my ability to, to, to go through a checklist and say, hey, I'm starting to have some problems with these things? That's the goal, is to understand how, as Dr. Bodie mentioned, on a day-to-day -day functioning level, how these blasts are affecting uh, the operator's lives and their ability to perform both in training and in combat. And we, you asked us in the beginning, where do we take our motivation from? What's our inspiration? And certainly trying to solve this incredibly complex problem is a yeah. key motivation. But for us, getting to meet these operators who are now coming almost every other week to Mass General Hospital and the Martino Center, we get to hear their stories, sit down, eat lunch with them, and hear about how their experiences have affected their lives at home, with their families and their friends. And it is, it's profoundly inspiring, the dedication, the commitment to excellence, yeah. and the selfless, the selfless sacrifice of this community, um, and the profound humility that they show, um, despite all their bravery and heroism. I mean, it is just incredible to get to interact with these guys, and it motivates us to try to figure out how we can best support them, how they can be effective on the battlefield, yeah. but also be effective at home. So this last one is this, what we call this Phillips Intellispace Cognitive Testing, right? Again, SAT words for us, right? So none of us passed the MCADs like you guys did. So what, what do I mean by that? What's a, what's a Phillips Intellispace Cognitive Testing? What does that mean? I'll let Dr. Boning take this sure. one. Okay. Uh, happy to. So, you know, in a standard neuropsychological assessment, assessment of your memory, attention, visual processing, all the things that, all of your thinking abilities, Typically what you're doing is you're sitting down with paper and pencil and there's somebody next to you and they are saying, now I'm gonna read you a set of instructions. I want you to you know, draw a line from here to here and pick, draw this picture and I'm gonna test your memory and whatnot. And that's quite cumbersome. That person then needs to go into your, into your reporting, they need to score everything, then they need to make an interpretation and then turn that into a round, into a product. Lots of paper involved, lots of data involved. Phillips really distills that down to an iPad. So think about now doing an entire battery of tests on an iPad, where you can sit with that iPad, you press start, and there are automatic instructions. Now please, I'd like you to do X, Y, and Z. Now please remember these words. And then all of the scoring and all of the interpretation is done on the back end, literally all with an iPad. 
a key part of Philips is that Philips is going to automatically score everything. They are, the Philips IntelliSpace platform has precise uh, timing of every single piece of the assessment. And we're going to get super granular, high definition data on cognition and thinking abilities that we cannot get with a paper and pencil test. That is the hope for Philips. Okay, so one last question, kind of bring all this back together. So we talked about advanced uh, neuroimaging, really, and this, this super MRI and, and the PET scan and all these neat things we can do, blood biomarkers, neurocognitive assessment tests and things that we can already do in the field, its implications for the wider fleet because we can do those things, uh, some TBI history and blast exposure, the types of things that we've been exposed to, even pre-service. Right, those are important. Um, and then this clinical and global self-reporting, if you will. And then finally, the inner, inner IntelliSpace cognitive testing that now using machine learning. When I put all this together, explain to me kind of at the very end here to wrap this up on how, does that, how do you take all that, fuse it together and make ReBlast what it is? Absolutely. Great question. So the idea is, as Dr. Edlow mentioned in the beginning, we have cast a very wide net. We are collecting hundreds of data points and hundreds of variables. At the end of the study, at the end of 30 participants who come here, the idea is to look at all of those variables and distill them down to just a small handful that can distinguish warfighters who have had a lot of exposure to BLAST to warfighters who have had less exposure to BLAST. We then take those variables, and as we are envisioning and thinking about the future, we bring them into a study that will apply those variables as we've talked about today, at the beginning of service. So we want to be able to get people, as they're going through selection, right after selection, do a baseline brief battery of just a couple of things that we found to distinguish people with low versus high blast exposure, and take that out and monitor them one year, two years, five years, even further post uh, enlisting and post service in, in the Special Operations Forces and beyond. And that is the information that's going to be able to tell us how are people changing, how is it tracking with blast exposure, and at the end of the day, we want a diagnostic test. Yeah. That is what we are motivated by. We need a diagnostic test that's going to tell us somebody's had blast exposure, they need to come off, they need to take a break, or we need to treat them. Yeah. Dr. Edlow. So, Chief Smith, you and General Clark and Sergeant Major Parrish talked on a recent softcast about this posture change from counterterrorism to the challenges posed by competing powers, challenges that we're all very familiar with given global events. And in that setting, optimal cognitive performance and brain health are more important than ever to ensure that soft can, can achieve the mission successfully that they need to achieve in the future. And what Dr. Bodine is describing is practical tools that can make a meaningful difference in the lives of the soft community. Again, we hope to advance knowledge. We want to understand the mechanisms, but the, at the end of the day, we are motivated by making the lives better of those who serve our country and protect Absolutely. us. Mick Pond, last words to you. No, I just appreciate that you would invite you know, the services into this because, you know, again, uh, what SOCOM does in development will affect the greater force and the greater nation you know, to follow. Yeah, so we're on the cutting edge of, of really understanding the brain and its functions on the warfighter and cognitive performance as we kind of go forward. So on behalf of General Clark and all of us here at, at the SOCOM team, first and foremost, thank you for what you do. Um, it does make a difference, and you're the true heroes and really pioneers that are that are advancing this battle space. And Mick Pond, you know, the Navy's always been a great partner with us, uh, line in, line out. And and as a naval special warfare recidivist yourself, right? It's good to it's good to have a fellow teammate back. So yeah. so again, uh, be sure to walk, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and and all the places. Download us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, and all the normal podcasts. On behalf of US SOCOM, thanks for joining us on Softcast. Thank <laughs> you.